Imagine enjoying a late night barbecue with your closest friends. You've just poured a glass of cold cider when suddenly everything changes. Moments before, you were enjoying a warm summer night, but now everything is lit up like daylight. With your hands blocking the light from your eyes, you look up to examine the source. After that, your life has changed forever. Today we'll be exploring the fascinating case of a shared alien abduction experience. Now, I must warn you that some aspects of this case are deeply troubling, so your discretion is advised. Before we get into it though, please take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel. I'm new here on YouTube, so I literally appreciate every like, share, or comment I get. So that being said, if you have a particular case or subject, be it Bigfoot, Dogman, Aliens, or Paranormal, that you would like me to cover in the future, please leave a comment below and I'll be sure to look into it. Okay, I think I've gone on long enough here. So with that, get comfortable, grab a snack, and let's get in the glow. Have you ever experienced one of those special summer nights that are really just perfect in every way? The breeze is cool and the crickets are chirping and everything just feels right. Well, way back in 1995 in Derbyshire, England, a married couple, Mike and Debbie, were experiencing a night just like that. Now it was getting late, but something about the energy and the warm air enticed them to stay out later than usual. And what they wanted to do really was open up some cold drinks and light up the barbecue. And what's a barbecue without friends, right? So what they decided to do was invite their friends and neighbors, Steve and Annie, over to join in in the festivities. Our story begins at about 10 p.m. at night, and it's at this point that Mike is just starting to light up the griddle. And by 10.40, the smell of barbecued chicken legs, burgers, and sausages filled the night air. Now, Mike and Debbie had a small garden table near where the food was cooking, so they all decided to sit down at the table together and enjoy a cold glass of cider. So like I mentioned before, the night was perfect and everything was going great. They were deep in conversation when suddenly something happened. All of their surroundings were suddenly lit up and it was as if the sun had managed to rise in a matter of seconds. Without warning, they were all completely enveloped in a bright light. Now, the light was coming from directly overhead, so they all looked up in a state of fear and amazement. And this is what they saw. Hovering only about 20 feet above their heads was a round metallic disc-shaped craft. The garden was completely lit up at this point by a set of bright white lights found on the underside of the craft, and the lights were moving in an anti-clockwise direction. After a moment of fear and confusion, they all noticed that something was happening on the underside of the craft, and it looked as if a door was slowly opening up. And from that opening, a column of bright white light shot down to the ground in front of them. And as soon as this happened, all four witnesses described the atmosphere shifting in an odd way. And what I mean by that is, it seemed like time began to slow down, and everything seemed a little bit more dreamlike. Steve would actually later describe the experience as being stuck in a vacuum. And to Steve, it appeared that everything was moving in slow motion. Now, after a short period of time, the craft slowly began to move away. All four witnesses watched the craft depart until it was nothing more than a small speck in the sky. Immediately after this, something strange began to happen because they all started experiencing nausea and extreme stomach pains, seemingly out of nowhere. After a few minutes though, those symptoms began to slowly fade. And at this point, Mike remembered that he had food on the griddle. So Mike rushed to the griddle to check on the food and what he saw disturbed him because the food was cold. And more than that, it was burnt. Confused by this, Mike checked his watch and realized that it was close to midnight. Now, obviously this confused the group because what they had experienced only lasted for a few minutes. So what were they doing for almost an hour and a half that they couldn't account for? At this point, Mike decided enough was enough and he called the cops. And to their credit, the cops actually took the matter seriously. They immediately searched the property for any missing items and actually discovered that two of the pint glasses that the group was using were missing. And they're still missing to this day. Baffled by the case, the police actually referred the group to a local UFO investigator, Tony Dodd, who himself was a former police officer. Now, this was not Dodd's first rodeo, as they say, and he was sure that there was more to the story than what the witnesses remembered. So Dodd actually suggested that they all undergo hypnotic regression therapy with a local regressionist who was known and respected, Joyce Dinsdale. And to Dodd's delight, all four witnesses actually agreed to do just that. And it was decided that each would be regressed separately. 
Now, remarkably, even though they were all regressed separately, they all told the same story. All except for one. You see, while Mike was being regressed, he became so agitated and so frightened that Joyce actually decided that it was no longer safe to continue the session. So what exactly scared Mike so much that a trained professional couldn't calm him down even while he was hypnotized? Well, after working with Debbie, Annie, and Steve, she soon found out. Now, Debbie's regression started out exactly as they all had remembered. They were enjoying a wonderful night, sipping on some cider, having a stimulating conversation, and then suddenly something happened, something that changed everything. While hypnotized, Debbie recalls seeing a flashing light appear suddenly over their heads. And something about the light felt off. Something about it frightened her. The light was, of course, coming from the circular craft that they had seen just before calling the police. She remembers looking around the yard, which at this point was lit up like daylight, and seeing Annie pointing up at the light in amazement. Debbie went on to describe the object further and noted that it had a round dome on top. Next, she noticed that the light started rotating and now included hues of green and red and white. And at this point, the lights were so bright that they were hurting her eyes. At this point in the session, Debbie became visibly distressed and upset. However, before the session was stopped, Debbie inexplicably calmed down. The next thing that Debbie remembers was being on her own. She was no longer with her friends in the garden. Still, much like when she was looking up at the craft, all she could see around her was light. Slowly though, she began to make out shapes and shadows moving around her. Now, she wasn't able to make out what these creatures were, but she could see their eyes. And according to her, the eyes were not like ours, but were large and black. Distressed, she tried to look away, but everywhere she looked, all she saw were black eyes staring back at her. Her memory then jumped to being laid down on a hard surface with her back propped up, and she could still see the shadows flitting about all around her, but she was still unable to recall exactly what they looked like. All she could recall was that they were shadows and they had big black eyes. Oddly enough, while she couldn't make out the beings, she could clearly see the room around her. She described that the roof of the room was strange and came down to the walls without joining. Now, I don't know exactly what she meant by that, but it is interesting because Annie would actually make a similar observation. At any rate, this was the last memory that Debbie was able to recall before she became too distressed to continue on with the session. So what were those shadow beings and what was the significance of those large black eyes that were staring back at her? Well, we're about to find out because Annie's regression was also successful and she was actually able to recall more details than even Debbie. While under hypnosis, Annie's session began in much the same way as Debbie's. Annie recalled the craft appearing overhead and shining the bright beam of light down into the garden, but she also remembered something else. According to Annie, as soon as the light hit the ground, she realized that they weren't alone. Standing only a few feet away from the group was, as Annie describes it, a small figure. The figure was dressed in a black cloak and had a hood. Annie was confused by this because she didn't know how the being had gotten there without them noticing its approach. It was almost as if it had just appeared there. Now, since her surroundings were completely lit up, she was able to see the figure's face, and she describes it as having pale skin, a pointed chin, and large black eyes. And while looking at the being, she suddenly realized that there were two more standing right beside it. Without warning, the creatures walked towards Annie, grabbed her by the arms, and dragged her towards the column of light. While dragging her, the creatures seemingly began communicating with each other by making strange animal-like grunting noises. Now, something to point out here, of course, as Annie was being drugged towards the light, her anxiety began to increase. However, much like Debbie had experienced, her next memory was of being on the craft with a sudden sense of calmness rushing over her. She later wondered if her abductors had given her some kind of drug or medication to help ease her anxiety. She went on to describe being in a bright room and explained that there were loads of little people standing all around the sides of the room. And much like the beings that she saw in the garden, 
They were all wearing black cloaks with hoods. She explained that they also had three fingers on each hand and spoke to each other by making strange guttural noises that left her feeling unnerved. All at once, without warning, the creatures all began to approach her and started grabbing at her face and even pulling her hair. All the while, they were making those otherworldly grunts that left her feeling deeply disturbed. And perhaps as a way to take her mind off of what was happening, Annie then began to describe the room around her in more detail. She first describes the walls as funny and round and divided into squares. Light was actually emanating from the walls themselves and she described the color of the light as being peachy. Now, the peachy colored light was very bright and irritated her eyes badly, and at times even caused her vision to blur. But then something happened that took Annie's attention off the room and back to what was happening around her. She first noticed that one of the beings was approaching her with a strange device in its hand. She describes the device as being, quote, a silver small square thing on the end of a rod. Next, she also noticed that a different being was scraping an instrument in between her toes. Now, shortly after that, one of the beings approached her and injected something into her neck using a long needle. After that, the being actually moved down and started doing something to her belly button, which Annie described as being horrible. Now, this actually reminds me a lot of the Betty and Barney Hill case, where Betty describes her abductors actually performing a pregnancy test on her by sticking a long needle into her belly button. Now, I'm not sure if that's what's happening in this case, but it definitely seems like a similar procedure. Whatever it was the beings were doing, it disturbed Annie greatly and her anxiety was definitely rising. All of a sudden, as if in response to this, one of the beings rushed forward, placing its face only inches away from her own. And she recalls looking deeply into its eyes while feeling something pressing down on her belly button. Now, this is also common in other abduction cases that I've read. For instance, if the abductee becomes too distressed, a lot of times, one of the aliens will rush forward and put its eyes inches away from the abductees. And after doing this, it seems as though the aliens can either calm down the abductee or paralyze them completely. Now, this is all speculation on my part, of course, but it does seem like the alien was trying to control Annie while the procedure was taking place. Now, at this point, Annie became increasingly agitated. Her last memory before the session ended was of being touched all over her body before blacking out. And the next thing she knew, she was standing back in the garden, watching the craft disappear into the night sky. So now we know what happened to the women, but what were the husbands up to this whole time? Well, although Mike's session was cut short due to his stress response, Steve was able to recall plenty, and none of it was pleasant. Steve's regression actually started out a little bit differently than the others. According to Steve, the night felt strange even before the lights were spotted. He recalls seeing the lights approach them and being mesmerized by them, and after a moment realized that there was a noise coming from just by his side. He looked over and noticed that his wife was staring up at the lights transfixed while also screaming at the top of her lungs. His attention then focused back on the lights. They were bright and flashing all around him. And before he knew it, he found himself standing up in a room, presumably inside the craft. Now the room was bright and as he describes it, it was filled with small people. Now like Annie, he describes the beings as wearing small black hooded cloaks and went on to describe the fabric as being like tinfoil. Upon further inspection of his surroundings, Steve actually realized that he was stuck in a clear tube that had no seams. And the beings were gathered all around, pressing in to get a good look at him. And after some time, Steve recalled being removed from the tube and taken to a different room. Now, this room was massive, and as Steve describes it, it was filled with loads of these small figures just moving around. And oddly enough, they were holding what Steve describes as balls of white stuff in their hands. They seemed to be carrying the white stuff around the room, and Steve was intrigued, but he couldn't make out exactly what the white stuff was or what they were doing with it. After this, he recalls seeing a board on the wall with, quote, figures of planets on it. And among the planets, he recalls seeing the depiction of Earth and Saturn. During this whole process, Steve appeared to be standing. However, he was completely unable to move on his own. He was completely paralyzed. Now, at this point, his memory became a little bit foggy, but he does recall being brought into an even larger craft 
than the one that had appeared over their heads in the garden. His last memory of being on the craft was of being frozen in a standing position, while the beings moved around him, grabbing and pulling at him, seemingly performing experiments on his body. After this, he was placed back in the tube and was once again enveloped in the bright light. And there he stood frozen. And at first, he thought he was alone until he started hearing the scream of his wife, Annie. He realized suddenly that his wife was actually standing right beside him and that they were both staring up at the craft, which was now hovering over their heads. Instantly, he realized that they were all back in the garden. And at this point, the lights on the craft began to move rapidly. And Steve recalled that he couldn't move a muscle and felt like he couldn't breathe. He wanted more than anything to look away from the lights, but he felt as if some outside force wouldn't allow him to do so. Then all at once, the craft began to move slowly away. And as it did, it began emitting a green light. And when he saw that light, Steve was able to move again and instantly began gasping for air. The four watched in silence, confused and terrified, until the craft appeared to be nothing more than a star in the sky. Thanks everyone for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did enjoy the show, please take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you have a topic or an encounter that you would like me to feature on the show, let me know in the comments below. I promise I will look into it. One last thing, if you like longer form content, please consider following our podcast, Firelight Vibes. We have real people on the show that come on and share their incredible encounters with the unexplained. And I'm really trying to get the ball rolling on the show. So any support that you can throw our way, we greatly, greatly appreciate. So I think that about does it for today. Thank you all again for tuning in and I hope you have a wonderful day.